night, church. Rainy, dreary day. Uh, feels to me like one of those days where I didn't really feel like going anywhere, but I also didn't feel like being cooped up in the house. <laughs> um, I'm one of those weird guys that if it's going to rain this hard in February, I wish it might as well just be snow, <laughs> but I think I'm probably outnumbered listening to everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, for the peace lamp today, I thought uh, I'd like to just challenge everybody to think about um, the very small blessings uh, that God gives us uh, in life. I know that when people ask me, or when I'm trying to uh, think about what it is I'm grateful for that, that God has provided for me, I do this, and I think a lot of people do too. I tend to my mind goes to some of the bigger things like my family, uh, you know, the lifestyle that we're able to live, the comfort and stability of, of living in this area, living in a politically stable um, uh, time. Uh, uh, but we forget the really small things. And one of the things that's been teaching me that uh, or challenging me to think about those small blessings is just um, we started tapping trees. And just to think about what a, what a miracle uh, it is that God provides us with, uh, with sap. You know, it's so small, but what they, the sweet water comes out of the uh, trees every year and we can make uh, maple syrup with it. It's a very small thing, but what a blessing to live in this world and to know that that is, is a gift uh, from God. Um, we read maybe in Exodus or whatever about the, uh, you know, the Israelites and the manna falls from heaven. Uh, and we think, wow, what a huge miracle. That kind of thing never happens today. But as we're driving around, literally all this sweet water is, is coming up from the earth through the trees. Uh, and that's a miracle too, in and of itself. So I've been trying as I've tapped in these trees to, to think about all those little uh, small gifts that are uh, available to us that are basically acts of love from God to us, right? So I invite everybody to reflect on something like that. Okay, we have a call and response for the call to worship today. God, you ask us to set our minds on you, to walk before you and be blameless. You teach us what matters, and you do not hide your face from us. God, you teach us that when we lose our life, we save it. God, you say you will make us exceedingly fruitful, that you will bless us. We believe your everlasting covenant is to be God to us and that we will live forever. We call out to you as you call us deeper into this covenant. Turn to 307 in hymnal worship book. Um, we'll sing the first four verses. Three oh seven. So I guess in your bulletin uh, is the prayer of confession and assurance that we will read together. It looks like it starts out with uh, you guys, so somebody will have to start. <laughs> he, calls to he calls to you from the depths of our hearts. 
We confess when we have stayed on the edges, not listening to each other, not taking the path you show. We confess when we have strayed from the way, silencing suffering, forfeiting life. Deep calls to deep. You call to us from the depth of your love. Calling us to deep commitment, we come to you, God. So, I'm to remind you that the offering box is in the back. Uh, I guess, you know, at the, when you can, just um, you can put money in that offering box and I can say a blessing over the offering. <clears throat> God, we're so thankful for the opportunity we have to gather here and um, thankful for the opportunity to give of what we have uh, to the cause of this church and the cause of your kingdom. And we just pray for discernment and wisdom and how to use those funds and, and what ways we can further, further your kingdom here in our area um, with the resources we're given. And we thank you for all of them. In your name, amen. This is a time to reevaluate. This is a time to ask yourselves, are we still on the right way with God or have we wandered off? And so he said to them, he said, stand at the crossroads and look. This is what the Lord says. Now, this isn't the crossroads, but it is the beginning of five different uh, paths. Let's look at these paths and think about what this decision this person is going to take. Now, these paths are pretty unusual. But they do represent something of the same kind of choices that face us. The first path here is like a, a fun path, okay? There's all kinds of fun things that are going to be going on in that path. The second path is just an old, simple path. It's been there a long time. The third path is a path that's paved with gold. The fourth path is a, a path that has flashing lights all the way along it. And the last path isn't a path at all. It's just a bunch of tiles. And what you can do is take those tiles and make your own path. This is a path that says, look, I want to do things my way. I want my life to be individual. I'm going to do it my way. This one perhaps is a path that says, I want to be where the flashing lights are. I want to be where the new thing is, where all the people are. I want to be, make sure that I'm where it's happening. This path probably for those who want their life to be all about financial gain, to make sure that they get what they need. This path is just perhaps an old path, perhaps for people who want to walk along a traditional path. And this path perhaps is for adrenaline junkies who can't stand the thought that life isn't going to be full of extreme action. What does Jeremiah say to the people? What is the word of God through Jeremiah? He says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask where the old path is. Ask where the good path is. And in the terms of Jeremiah, he's saying the old path is actually the good path. Now, it doesn't mean that everything that's old is good. It doesn't mean that everything is, that's new is bad. Because God will often say, I want to do a new thing among you. But in terms of the road that leads to eternal life, he says, don't veer from the road that I've set before you because the road has been there since the beginning. The path of faith in God has never changed. God has never changed. His law has never changed. Our inability to keep the law has never changed. And the solution of how our sins can be forgiven has never changed either. It's found in Jesus Christ. The old path is the good path. Why? 
because it's the old path that has Jesus on it. It's the old path that is built upon the Word of God. But Jeremiah says one more thing. He says, don't just ask where the good road is. He says, walk on it. You know, it's one thing to know what we should be doing and do something completely different. But he says this is a time of reconsidering and actually making that commitment to walk along the road you know you should be in. Why? Because he says, if you find that road, you will find peace for yourselves. Another version says, peace for your soul. This road leads to heaven. What does Jesus say? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There is no name given under heaven by which anybody can be saved except that of Jesus. He is the narrow way. Maybe few find it, but if we get onto that road, we will find eternal salvation. There's one last thing he says, and this is Jeremiah 6, 16. The last thing he says is this. He says, but some of you said, we will not walk on the good road. It amazes me that humans have this ability to say no to God, to actually say, no, we've, we've got a better idea, or we don't want to do the thing that leads us to salvation. You know, Jeremiah had a tough time trying to speak to the people of his day, but that doesn't mean that we can't respond. And if we've been somewhere where we shouldn't be, you know, or maybe we've never found that good path in the first place, I think this time of year is a time when we can make that recommitment to God and say, I want to get back onto that good road because it's the good road that leads me to eternal life. Must have been the fall that caused it, you know. That's, that's the excuse. Uh, what was that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you. I knew there was a voice from up there. Uh, Jerry's been working on the website, and uh, you can now find the daily devotional uh, on the website. So you can either go to YouTube, which some of you do, or you can go to the church Facebook page, which more of you do, and now you can go to the church web page. Uh, so you have three options. Uh, of how to find that if you would like to find it. Um, and, uh, and before I get any, any feedback from the peanut gallery, uh, I don't have to wear this when I'm sitting down uh, or kind of standing still. So you will not see me wearing this crazy thing in the devotionals, but that's not because I'm being a bad boy. Uh, it's because I'm, I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm just stubborn. All right, a couple of little stories here before we, before we get going. I thought this would get our day started rightly. There was this, uh, this guy playing checkers with a second grader. I don't know if you've ever played checkers with a second grader. I don't know if you've ever played any game with a second grader, but you, you, you got to know one thing. Those characters are sharp. And so while they're playing... The, the second grader asked him what were his favorite things. And he wasn't really sure what to say. I mean, what do you say that a second grader can understand? So he tried to be funny. And he said, I think, he said, I think my favorite things are new shoes and clean socks. The guy looked at him, the little second grader, and says, well, if you like clean socks, you're playing with the wrong kid. And then I, I kind of like this one. The, the Sunday school superintendent uh, went over to the church to get some, some material out of a locked cabinet. And they hardly ever go in there, but he went up and, or went and got the pastor, and the pastor said, well, I'll give it a try. So they go down there, and he, he puts his fingers on the lock, and and then he stops and he looks up at the sky, up at the ceiling. And then he goes back down and he turns it and he opens up. And the Sunday school superintendent said, wow, I'm impressed. He said, oh, don't, don't, don't be. The combination's written down up on the ceiling up there. Okay, so much for that part. Let me share 
a verse, a few verses of, of the word for you this morning. It comes from Romans chapter 4 and verses 18 to 25. It's in the bulletin if you, if you want to follow along. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do whatever he promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. theme of our Lenten series is called to, and today it's called to commitment. Now I want you to think about that for a little bit. What are you committed to? Um, I heard someone say years ago, if you want to know what's really important to you, then all you have to do is get out a piece of paper and write down the five things that you usually or you spend most of your money on and write down the five things that you spend most of your time on and then write down five things that you spend most of your time thinking about. So what you spend your money on? what you spend your time doing, what you spend your time thinking. And he said, now, those things will demonstrate what you're really committed to. That's a sobering thought. And sometimes we find that we really are committed to something we didn't know we were committed to and don't want to be committed to. And then sometimes we find, as the video said, that we really know what to do, but we're just not doing it. <laughs> uh, I, heard, I heard a story about uh, a mom talking to her son, and she was trying to get through to him. He had to do what she told him. And so she said, if you don't do this, you're going to go through a portal It's going to carry you to another world, and you will never be seen again. The guy looked at him and says, oh, come on, Mom. You think I'm going to believe that? And she said, well, that's exactly what your older brother said. And he said, what older brother? And she said, exactly. (laughs) You know, our walk with God is a is a strange hodgepodge of great moments and not so great moments, of moments that are ecstatic and moments that are full of sadness. There are moments of unbelief, and then there are moments of, oh, of course, why didn't I think of that? It's just our walk with God is, is a constant journey. And, and last week, I mentioned, I talked about how there are, two worlds in which we live, the physical world that we see and the spiritual world that sometimes we can see. And I said that if all you ever see is the physical world, which is where you're going to make your decisions and whatnot, if that's all you ever can see, then you're going to miss out on most of what God is really trying to do in your life. And I want you to keep that thought in mind because it fits here to this conversation about Abraham. 
It starts out by saying, against all hope. What is hope? Well, I think there are two kinds. One is based on wishing. The other is based on assurance. You remember back when, uh, when that uh, power mega ball was worth about a billion dollars? Few, maybe a month ago, a few weeks ago. I don't know about you, but I already had figured out what I was going to do with it. I already planned out who I was going to give some to, what I was going to do with the rest. And I told Faith, I said, when I win this billion dollars, here's what we're going to do. And she said, John, you can't win it if you don't buy a ticket. I said, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. See, that was a, that was a wishing hope. As, as we would say at my house, I was hoping my ship had come in. Um, I don't know what that means, but we say it all the time, particularly since we've never lived near the water. But there's a wishing. I wish. I wish. I wish. I hope. I hope I'm going to grow up and be president. How many people thought that? After these last few years, who wants to do that? You've got to be nuts in your head somewhere to want to do that. I want to grow up and I want to be this or I want to be that. And I, I had a, a student at Talladega. He was a big guy. He was about six foot seven. Weighed, I don't know, 250, 260. And I asked him one day, I was asking the class, and he spoke up first, and I said, uh, what do you want to do with your life? He says, I want to be an NFL football player. I said, really? He said, Yeah. I said, how are you going to do that? He said, well, when I finish college, I'm going into the NFL. I said, well, did it ever occur to you, but Talladega College doesn't even have a football team? He's just wishing. I, I don't know where he was, his head was. Now, maybe he could have been an NFL player if he played football <laughs> or went to a school and was on a team or something. He's, just wishing. And lots of our hopes are wishes. And that's not what this one's talking about. This one is talking about hope based on assurance. And it starts out by saying, against all hope. Now here's the situation. It shows up in the next verse. Uh, well, yeah, the next verse. Abraham faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. He was about 100. Now, I know Strom Thurmond had kids when he was about 87, but this is, this is way beyond that, and that Sarah's womb was dead. Now, if you were a betting man, how much would you have bet that they'd have a kid that was going to bless all of the world for all time? It's not going to happen. That's a wishing kind of a hope. Oh. But Abraham had a hope based on assurance. And what was the assurance? The assurance was what God had promised. And what God had promised was, you're going to be the father of a blessed nation. You're going to have more offsprings than the sand at the beach. And now he's 100 years old. And it still hasn't happened. Hebrews 11 says, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for in the assurance of what we believe. Abraham hoped based on something that was unshakable. And the unshakable thing was God's promise. Even though the world he saw and the world everybody else around him saw said, you're nuts. Is something wrong with you? You really think this is going to happen? Now, the closest example we got is Edgar and Alice back there. You guys waiting for a new baby? Well, you know, that's kind of the reaction Abraham and Sarah would have gotten in their canal. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but he kept his hope. 
And he kept his hope because his hope wasn't in himself. It wasn't in somebody else. It was in God. And he goes on to say that his hope was accounted to him as righteousness. You see, Abraham's confidence in God doing what he said was rooted in his knowledge of who God is. If we don't know much about God, we, it's going to be awfully hard to have any confidence and hope in anything. You know, if, if God is just someone you talk about every once in a while, or as many people do, use it in the, in the phrase of a, uh, a very uh, unkind phrase of two words, then of course you're not going to have any hope in God. You can't. But when you know him, and you know him because you've, you've read the scriptures, you've talked to him in prayer, you've watched him work, you've shared him with others, you've seen others' lives change, you've seen your life change. When you have that kind of a relationship with the Lord, we can have absolute hope and confidence in what it is that he says he's going to do. Let's read this little part here. Verse 21. Abraham, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Now, it's one thing to say God can do anything, and then another thing to believe that he's going to do it. I've encouraged people over the years to pray specifically. Because if I'm concerned about something, I want to make sure that I've told God from my heart exactly what it is I'm concerned about. And it's not that he doesn't know it. It's not that somehow I'm going to surprise him. It's just based on a relationship with him, i got to be able to tell him that. So if I want to bring healing to my arm, then I ask God, please heal my arm. And maybe he'll heal something else in the process. I don't know. But we have to be on close enough terms that God is our best friend. Now, I know a lot of churches, a lot of denominations, a lot of teachings, God is something unapproachable out there. But he isn't. A phrase I've used that I was going to use more often this year and I, or last year, and I forgot or got something happened. But we need to walk so close to Jesus that the dust from his feet get our feet dirty. God wants a relationship with you and me. And I think everybody here knows that. Everybody here believes that. It's not... God's, well, let me rephrase it. It's not on God's shoulders to have a close relationship. It's on ours because he's right there. He's already offered it. And Abraham knew that even when the situation in his mind was hopeless and so in everybody else's mind. And I don't know about you, but I've been in some hopeless situations. And I can tell you, they're not fun. There's nothing good about them. Oh, somebody come along, well, this is so you will build faith. No, it's not. If I didn't have the faith in the first place, I'd be in big trouble at that point. It's so I can wait for God to work. There's so much that I can't do on my own. I'm a pretty talented fella. I can can do a number of things. 
Some of them really good. But there are other things I can't do. And, and I get frustrated when I can't do them. Because I think I ought to be able to. And particularly when it comes to figuring something out. I ought to be able to figure this out. And I've learned over the years that if I can get other people to help figure in with me, we got a better chance of figuring it out. When we give God a chance to work in our lives, we have a better chance of getting whatever it is we're dealing with dealt with. When we're just waiting for the good times and the rest of the times complain, well, not a whole lot's going to happen. See, we have to have what Jesus called childlike faith. Remember the story in Matthew 10, 14? Uh, he was teaching, and a bunch of kids come up, and the disciples are irritated. These, the disciples now, these are not ungodly people. These are, these are his followers who have been with him for several years, and they say, you know, get these kids out of here. And he said, no, 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 no. Let them come to me, for such is the kingdom of God. Children have an ability to believe that adults don't have. Now, we could say it's not a mature belief. Well, maybe that's true. But not to them. As we get older and older, we come up with more and more excuses as to why God isn't such and such. And instead, we ought to come up with more and more obvious examples of why God is whatever. And so, what we want to get you to think about this Sunday is commitment, your commitment. Abraham's commitment took him through the, what had to have been an unimaginable weight. We are, so, we are so instantaneous in what we do. Everything has to be a 30-second sound bite or... If I've got a pain, give me a pill that's going to solve it right now. Uh, I had to wait sometimes for the pain pills to start to work. That wasn't any fun. It just wasn't. But everything doesn't work instantaneously. I've known some people that have prayed for their neighbors 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years before they ever saw a change in their behavior. We can tell some, we can invite somebody to church for 30 years and then all of a sudden they show up and you wonder what happened. A commitment means I'm going to stick to it. I don't care what happens, I'm going to stick to it. Now, it's not a commitment based on my abilities. There are a lot of goofy people out there that are committed to something that's never going to work. I'm talking about being committed to what God wants you or me to do. And, and so, as we sort of finish up, somehow we're moving along faster, or maybe that, actually, maybe that, I don't know if that clock's right or not, but that's all right. The time today is to think about commitment. I can't tell you what your commitment is. Only you can tell you. And as I say in my devotionals many times, you know, you can do whatever you want to do. I, I can't control that. I just invite you to think about it. So I want to invite you this morning. We're going to play a song here. There it's not a fancy video. It's, it's just got the words on it. Uh, but I want you to think about the words, and I want you to ask yourself the question as it's playing, how strong is my commitment? How much more work do I need to do to be the person that God wants me to be? to
I want to end with a personal note. I want to thank everybody for your prayers and concerns when I injured my back. It's doing really pretty good. It's kind of sore. And, and this thing is more for just in case I fall again than much of anything else. Um, I'm already forgetting to wear it sometimes. And um, I guess this is coming off. And uh, my wife reminds me of that. So you don't have to. And, and I want to tell you that I believe that uh, you guys, this church, was really what Faith and I needed, even though we didn't know that. And I kind of want to believe that maybe Faith and I were what y'all needed even though you didn't know that. And I say all of that because I was such a good patient at the hospital, they have invited me back. It seems that, uh, uh, unknowing all of it to me, um, I now have to have open heart surgery. Um, Apparently, my heart rate dropped to 30 while I was in the hospital, and that kind of shook people up a little bit. Didn't bother me at all, but kind of shook them up. And uh, so I have to go back in. Um, there's some blockage they have to fix, uh, the rhythm they have to fix, and I have a valve that has to be replaced. And so the surgeon said, Tuesday... We might as well just go in and do it all at the same time. And I'm thinking, well, that's easy for you to say. So I've got another heart cath scheduled when they call me. I don't know when it'll be. Uh, sometime soon, I hope. And then after that, the, the group of heart surgeons at Ruby, 15 of them, will get together and decide what they need to do and how they need to do it. Uh, according to what he said, <clears throat> Uh, I don't, I don't want to minimize any of this. Uh, it just seems surreal that somebody's going to go and hold my heart in their hands. But I still believe that, uh, that God brought me here to do something, and that something isn't finished. So I'm going to be taking a few Sundays off sometime here in the next month or so. Don't know when, but I'll let you know. He said it'd take about six or eight weeks for full recovery. So I'm hoping that by summer when the virus is kind of all done or done enough, we can be a regular church activities again. I'll be all ready to go. I sort of feel like uh, I'm a NASCAR car. You know, each week they rebuild the engine, whether it's broken or not, just so it won't break again. So I think I'm going in for a tune-up before something breaks. Um, I have all the confidence in the world that uh, God is at work and uh, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, but I want you to know that. And I want you to know that when the rumor mill gets kicked in, I'm not retiring, I'm not resigning, I'm not dying, at least I don't think so. And uh, I'm just going to be kind of slowed down for a little bit longer than I anticipated. Um, but you know, if you can see the kingdom as well as the earthly world, life looks a whole lot better. It looks a whole lot more encouraging. Uh, so um, I guess that's what I'm going to do for a little while. I'm hoping that we, I might get through Easter before they start. But then again, maybe I don't want them to wait till Easter before they start. <laughs> um, but whatever God's going to do here is going to be fine. And uh, the elders have let me know that I can take off some time if I need it. Uh, I've offered to preach some uh, video sermons if you want that. Um, 
I told Faith, it's awfully hard for me to preach when there's nobody in the audience. And she said, well, if you do that, I'll recruit some people to sit in the audience. And I'm going to have enough devotionals made up so that we won't, I won't miss out like I did the last time. He said I'd be in the hospital about five days, and then I'd come home. And that's kind of what I'm expecting. So I appreciate your prayers in the, in the future. I appreciate your understanding. And uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being such a wonderful church in so many, many ways that you don't even realize. Uh, and I'm also going to pray that there isn't going to be any ice between now and then. Uh, that would not be helpful to me, evidently. <laughs> so with that, I want to remind you of your commitment to the Lord and what he wants for you in your life. I'm reminded of what he wants for me in mine. And I have full confidence. As I said in the beginning, I'm good for five to ten years at least. The doc asked me how long did I want to live, and I said, well, at least 15 to 20 years. And he said, oh, okay, we'll fix it. He said, if you only told me two or three, I'd just say forget it and you could go ahead and die. He's a real down-to-earth, straight-shooter kind of a fella. <laughs> So I just looked and said, gee, thanks. I appreciate the confidence there. Uh, but my heart is strong. I haven't had a, heart, had a heart attack. It pumps well. It just needs a couple of fixing places. And so I'll get that done, and then we'll go from there. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, as we leave this place, may your wonder and your grace and your joy touch our hearts. May we see your face in a new and a fresh way. May we do everything that we can that you want us to do for the rest of our lives. For truly, God, you are worth giving our lives to. Thank you, Jesus, for this day and for these moments. Thank you for the people who have helped make the service what it is. And in the future, we'll make it even better and better. Thank you for this Lenten time that we might think about you as we approach the wonderful, magnificent day of Easter. And we thank you, God, so much that you love and you care about us. For we ask these things in the mightiest name in the world, the name of Jesus. Now, our last song doesn't have a, a visual component to it as well, so if you will...